All right, so I think I'm gonna get started. It's uh, 11.30. A few people might uh, end up uh, walking in, but that's all right. Uh, so I, I just want to introduce myself to everybody. I'm Sterling. Uh, I'll be, give, be giving this talk with Will, who wrote the Nimble controller. So we're both developers on the Apache Minute project, uh, which is an open source operating system for MCUs. And I'll give a little bit of context on Minute here, but uh, just by way of my background. Uh, so I'm CTO and a co-founder of a company called Runtime. Uh, and right, what Runtime's mission is, is to develop open source software for embedded microcontrollers. So not just Cortex-M's, but think uh, software like, Cort or processors like Cortex-M's, which traditionally haven't had op operating systems or really a lot of good quality open source software that companies can adopt. Runtime was kind of founded to modernize development for the Cortex-M style of processor. So that includes MIPS and RISC-V and a number of other architectures. Uh, and and, and our, we started a project in the Apache Software Foundation called Apache Minute. Uh, prior to working at Runtime, I worked at a company called Silver Spring Networks, which did large-scale wireless mesh networking. Uh, so we networked power meters and street lights and distribution automation controllers. And we developed a uh, completely proprietary uh, networking stack that was layer one through layer seven on what, what was originally AVR at mega processors, so at mega 128s. Uh, we fit an IPv6 stack on there and then grew to be ARM 7s and eventually Cortex M's. And uh, what we found is, an, and kind of the background on Apache Minute, what we found was that every single company was building their own operating system. And so we started Apache Minute within the Apache Software Foundation to help address that. Uh, since then, we've also become members of the Zephyr Project. So uh, we're civil me silver members on Zephyr. We're collaborating on LWIP and a number of other open source projects. So our, our vision and our goal in the space is really to get good quality open source software that companies can use and adopt. Um, but this, so this talk is on the, the uh, Bluetooth stack within the Apache Minute operating system. Uh, Apache Minute is an Apache Software Foundation project, which means it's not run or controlled in any way by runtime, but rather it's a community-driven open source project. And, and the way that works is uh, it's not corporations who control the direction of the project, but it's individuals. Uh, so it's the people who commit code, who elect other committers, and then the project itself is run within the Apache Software Foundation, which is a 501c3 charity. Um, and so there's really no corporate control. Control is given to the individuals. And we decided that this was the right place to develop an operating system effort. Because what we saw in too many cases is you'd either have something about like Free Artos, which was owned by an individual company uh, and licensed GPL or dual licensed, which made it really hard to build a large ecosystem around it. Um, or you would have other projects that were just a little too GPL'd for the space. Uh, so Riot would be an example of that, where it was hard to adopt it into products because in, in, a, in the, the kind of sub Linux world, everything gets linked into a shared binary. So your application and your proprietary uh, software would have to be GPL'd if it relied on efforts in the space. So Apache Minute was started about a year and a half ago. And the idea is a completely open source operating system for these Cortex-M devices. It's a real-time operating system, but it's more than what you would think of as a traditional operating system, which is just the core of the RTOS. The idea is to give a, a Linux-style effort for these uh, Cortex-M systems. So at the very base level, there's a secure bootloader and flash file systems and flash access mechanisms. There's a real-time OS and a hardware abstraction layer. There's driver infrastructure and power management. Uh, there's a whole bunch of debugging uh, data there. And then kind of most germane to this talk, there's a completely open source Bluetooth stack in there called Nimble. Uh, and Nimble is both an open source controller that works on the Nordic NRF51 and the Nordic NRF52, as well as a completely open source Bluetooth host stack. Um, and, and that's built directly into the, the, the operating system itself. So this talk is primarily focused upon Nimble, but it's within the context of the Apache Minute project, which is really designed to basically have completely open source software for Cortex-M style microcontrollers. So why an open source Bluetooth stack? Uh, this was actually the surprisingly one of the, the most common question we got 
when we started developing Nimble. And it was, it was primarily asked to us by chip vendors, but pretty much everybody in the space was like, well, you already have stacks from the various chip vendors themselves. So Nordic has a soft device, which is stable and tested, and everybody uses. So they wondered why an open source Bluetooth stack. Uh, other vendors similarly buy stacks from companies like Mindtree, and they license those stacks with commercial support. And so the, the big question we got was kind of, why do your own stack when there's already a Bluetooth stack out there? And there's kind of a couple reasons that we, we thought of doing it. One is, in a lot of cases, people who develop software for these Cortex-M microcontrollers, they don't actually have access to the source, right? So you're developing your Bluetooth application on a Nordic processor, and you have no visibility into what's actually happening when you use the soft device. You have no source code for it. In addition to that, we were working on a project. Uh, it was a customer who was looking to use Minute, was looking to use an RTOS, uh, and they were trying to figure out what the problems were using the soft device. And the CPU would just mis mysteriously disappear, right? Because you have the Bluetooth stack is the highest priority uh, thing running on that chip. And so if you're running your real-time operating system or you're running your application, suddenly you lose the CPU. Now, is that causing a bug in your system? Maybe, probably not. But you're constantly wondering what's happening on the chip. And that's really a uh, artifact of the fact that if you look at kind of the early uh, series of Nordic processors, they were designed more as controllers or more as very simple application processors. They weren't really designed to write complex applications on them. So the NRF51 has a Cortex M0 microcontroller, M0 plus microcontroller on it. And it has 128K of flash and 16K of RAM. Maybe you were blinking an LED or controlling a, a very simple motor. But what you've seen over time is that as the, the kind of the process sizes for these chips have gone down, they've been able to bundle in more complex processors and more RAM and flash into the chip itself. So the, the current generation of the NRF series has 512K of flash and 64K of RAM, which for the Linux people here is like nothing, but for us is more than you could ever need. Um, and then if you look at Nordic's next generation processor, it's about a mega flash and 256K of RAM. And you're starting to see the chips in this space get to that kind of mega flash, 256K of RAM uh, space. And now you have a fairly complex application that you're developing within that footprint, but you actually still have no access to, to the highest priority thing on the, the, the chip, which is the Bluetooth stack that's running. So it's very hard to debug these stacks, and that was one of the major reasons we decided to write an open source one. But then it also, it, what we found is it also came, became a real benefit to have a more flexible architecture. Right? If you look at people who are developing these applications, and you look as an example for the soft device, the, the challenge that people who are developing the soft device have is because they're shipping you a pre-compiled binary without source code access, they have to compile it for 90% of their users, right? So everybody who is using the, the Nordic platform or any of these platforms, whether it be the KW41Z or another platform like that, they have a support issue, which is they need to compile one binary that works for 90% of their users. And so the 10% of their users it doesn't work for are kind of stranded and without luck. And in addition, it kind of restricts what you can do with the stack. So as an example, uh, Bluetooth 4.2 is something that our customers sometimes want to run on NRF51s. They want to be able to compile out certain features but add other features. So they might want to run with data length extension but not with security. If you have an open source stack and it's configurable, it gives you the flexibility to choose what you want to put in there. The other side of that, so we can get really small, and Will will show you some of the code size numbers that we've gotten on the NRF series. But the converse of that is also performance. So we support 32 simultaneous connections in our Bluetooth stack. And the reason that a lot of proprietary stacks don't support that is not because they don't have the CPU or processing or, or ability to write that software, but because it takes a lot of RAM. So people who often do applications like real-time location services, where you're a lock, or a, or a light where you want to track people or a lock where you want to see where people are, it helps to have a lot of connections because you can constantly be connecting to people, seeing how far they are, and, and tracking them in a, in a place before you decide to open a door. So having that flexibility to either compile down to really, really small software sizes where you don't want certain features or increase the RAM and increase the code for more complex use cases is another big reason. 
And then finally, it just ends up being a more efficient process when it's open, right? We can have a unified buffering scheme, for example, across IP. If you, it, today, if you were to run an IP stack, there would have to be copies in and out of the Bluetooth stack itself. Whereas if you have it all open, you can have a unified buffering scheme that you manage and you can have zero copy from the controller all the way through your application. So it's, it ends up being less wasteful. And then the, the last thing, and, and this is one that's starting to become more of a, a, of a big deal now that we're starting to add more platform support, is that you can migrate your application across processors without having to retest and recertify the entire thing. So today, if you're using a Bluetooth chip from Nordic and you want to eventually switch to NXP's chip, for example, you would have to use a completely different Bluetooth stack on NXP than you would use on Nordic. And you would have to completely retest your application when you make the switch between chipsets. If there are bugs that you've worked around on the Nordic uh, chip, you would have to work around different bugs on the NXP chip. And so it becomes very hard to switch between chipsets and choose the right chipset for you based upon power, performance, and price. And so by having a, an open source Bluetooth stack that works across platforms, it allows you to migrate between chipsets without having a massive software porting effort. Uh, so that's one of the reasons. So some of the highlights of, of Nimble. So it's uh, fully Bluetooth 4.2 compliant. Uh, we as Runtime uh, show up at Unplug Fests. We test with all of the other vendors. Uh, we've run PTS across the entire host, and it passes all of the PTS suites. Uh, in the next month or two, we're, we'll be going for certification on the stack, uh, but it, it fully complies with, with PTS. Uh, it has a constrained footprint, so Will will give you a bit more of the sizing numbers, but on the NRF 51, we're able to fit the entire Bluetooth stack into about 80K of code. Uh, as a comparison, the Nordic stack is 108K of code, uh, so it it's gives you a significant amount of code back. Um, it's high performance. Uh, so when it comes to uh, throughput numbers and, and throughput were uh, you know, five, five X faster than Nordic in some cases. Uh, in addition to that, we support about 10 X the number of connections from the Bluetooth. You have all the source, as I mentioned. Uh, we support low power operation modes. So it ties within, the, the, within our minute RTOS, has the concept of a low power mode and, and system states. The Bluetooth stack actually ties into those system states. And there's now been a little bit more work to actually leverage low power timers on the Nordic chip and things like that. Um, it's configurable. There's lots of different options that we, we've added to the stack that are all changeable through our system configuration interface. And then finally, it's debuggable. And by debuggable, A, you have the source, which is really the ultimate in terms of being able to debug things. But also, a, a large part of Minute is a large part of the effort that we've put into Minute is to make things very easy when you have a device in the field to understand what's going on. And that was our, based on our experience at Silver Spring where we had to manage uh, 22, 23 million devices. So everything in, our, in Minute has a unified logging infrastructure that can go out to the console when you're debugging things, but that you can either write to multiple flash buffers or multiple RAM buffers when you go to production. You can control what gets logged on a module basis or on a level basis. And all of that is remotely accessible. Either you can pull that back over Bluetooth or any of the transports we support. There are also extensive statistics that we keep on the operation of the system. And we support core dumps within Minute. So when things crash, we actually write those to flash and you can pull those back, which are not things that you have with any of the existing proprietary stacks. Uh, so there's really been an, a lot of effort put into making the Minute stack very easy to debug and easy to debug remotely. You know, one of the biggest things we hear from customers is I'm out in the field and a certain, an Android doesn't seem to work with this. Or even worse than that, in a lot of cases, it's not just Android, but it's a specific version of Android that's tied to a specific controller, right? So how do you understand what type of devices you're interacting with, what type of errors you're seeing in the field, and how do you bring that back remotely? A lot of that effort has been put into Nimble. So I'm gonna let Will, Will get up here. Uh, Will has been, uh, built the controller for our Bluetooth stack and has been one of the core developers of the Bluetooth stack. He's going to talk a little bit more about the, the, the layout of the stack, the source code layout, and give you some examples on, on the details of it. So I'll hand it off to Will.
You'll have to excuse me a bit. I think my voice is a bit out from talking at the booth a lot. So uh, let me skip over to the next slide. So a little background on myself. My name is Will. Um, so I worked with Sterling at Silver Spring Networks and before that at a company called Metricom. Uh, we did sort of like the Ricochet uh, wireless data network. So I pretty much spent most of all my time doing uh, wireless frequency hopping Mac protocols and embedded firmware. So the uh, Bluetooth stack was a good fit. <clears throat> um, so what we are not uh, showing a lot of or talking about here is the package management tool called Newt that allows you to you know, see a lot of um, configuration options that you choose, um, choose what build packages you want um, you know, for your application. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the sample apps that we have that do some things um, that folks can use to um, you know, use as examples to do their own applications. So th the basic um, layout of this, and if, if you go you know, to the source code and download it, you can see the directory structure. Um, we build a host only, controller only, and a combined controller host. Um, the way you sort of um, you know, glue the two together are the transport layer and uh, the UARTs and HCI transport layer, and the RAM one is you know, the uh, combined uh, host controller transport layer. Um, and yeah, so the code's located, uh, if you go, it's all in a network directory, so if you go to net nimble host, you'll find the host source code. Um, we have services separated out in an underlying directory under there, um, and these are all packages, which is you know, a good thing, so you know, let's say you don't wanna do, uh, Let's go back to, I knew that was gonna happen. Let's go full screen, I don't know. Okay, it's good, okay, good. Um, so you can choose what packages you want in the build. Like Sterling said, it's highly configurable. So if you want certain services, you can bring them in. If you don't, you don't have to include them. Let's uh, go on to the next slide here. Um, so what we're showing here is sort of a, a sample um, configuration file. These are all in these files called sysconfig.yaml files. and they're package based, so when you go to a certain package, um, and you'll see there's like a package.yaml file which describes things about the package. Um, you'll see this file in, in the uh, directory as well, and you can go in there and it's text-based, it's pretty easy to go in there and modify and um, you know, see what configuration options that, that you want to include. And obviously these are all for saving code and RAM. And you know, if you only want your device to be a peripheral, you choose peripheral. If you don't want it to, you know, if you want it to be a central and peripheral, you would, um, you know, define both, and that code gets included. And it's uh, the the package management tool also allows you to pretty easily view the uh, configuration settings for your for your for your build. Um, you know, I don't have any examples of that, but um, you know, it's a simple command line you know tool that you can use to you know, display all. It's pretty very really easy to use and. After using make files for most of my life, you know, this package management tool is actually really cool. Um, I like it much better. <laughs> um, and I guess, uh, yeah, so, you know, some of the options here, you know, if you only want a connection, you can choose one. Um, you know, I showed 16 here, but you can go up to pretty much, it's configurable, so if you have a lot of RAM, you can go to more than 32. Um, so you just have to set it up and let's see what else we got here. And um, yeah, and multiple roles can be supported simultaneously. We'll go a little bit more into that, but you know, you can be you know a central and a peripheral, um, you know, at the same time, and have multiple connections for each type. Um, so this is a little bit about the code size for um, various features in the in the OS. So the, the bootloader is so this, there. We have a secure bootloader, which is around 12k. Um, and these are pretty much based on um, the Nordic platforms. Um, although, you know, you don't get too much different with others. Um, the core RTOS is, is really small, it's about seven K, K bytes. Um, so the controller base is around 20, and if you were to go to the controller package and look at the configuration options, you, know, you can choose things, you know, if you look at 4.2 features, you know, let's say you, you don't want data length extension, you would take that out and your code base would get smaller. There's encryption, privacy, all the features are separately configurable through this, this file, and you can decide which ones you want. Um, we definitely still have a little bit more work to make it a little bit better. Um, you know, if you were to choose central and peripheral, you know, not everything gets compiled out, and um, you know, we're gonna be working a little bit more on that, so we'll be able to better these numbers um, in, in not the far, too far distant future. Uh, the host base is not that much more, actually the host can get 
quite large, like when we say the complete host, that com uh, contains a whole bunch of debugging, statistics, logging, um, a lot of extra code to make it sort of like really easily testable. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the application that we have for that. Um, so it's a, yeah, PTS testing was done with this app. It's a nice little command line tool that you can do quite a, a bunch of the Bluetooth stuff with. And, um, you know, I think when it all adds up, you know, you can fit this anywhere, like Sterling said, you know, even, you know, 70 to 100 and, you know, 30, 140K. So for most processors these days, that's good. For some of the smaller ones, it's a little bit tricky, but um, a lot of times it's RAM. That's, uh, you know, what you really have to optimize for. And um, we still have a little bit of work, I'd say, to do to get it, <laughs> you know, optimize it, the, the connections for, you know, if you're doing just centrals or peripherals, but, you know, we feel pretty good about the total RAM usage, um, you know, for the stack. So supported platforms. Um, so the host can run on a number of the different processors that um, you know we support. You know we plan to add a lot more processor support. You know as we go along, and you know hopefully that's why we also have a community. And you know anybody who wants to add processor support, you know, be great. You know <laughs> we love people. You know contributing to the project. And um, but we have a, a um, you know a few of them like uh, some of the major ones, and uh, you know. An upcoming one is going to be some of the NXP chips, which we're going to, you know, port the controller to, and um, the host pretty much just ports. It's, you know, that's, you know, pretty non-platform specific code. Um, and yeah, so we have mentioned here for the controller, it's the NRI 51 and 52. Um, we've also been playing around with their new chip, the 52840. Um, you know, so we have this stuff basically up and running there, but there's a number of features of that processor that we'll start adding to as we go along. And the NXP KW41Z um, is a uh, you know, work in progress. And uh, we plan to add more as time goes on, but uh, you know, we'll see which ones um, get picked. And again, you know, people who want to add stuff to the community, we're totally psyched about that, so. <laughs> so um, this is a little bit more about the controller specifics themselves. Um, so this is, uh, you know, most of my effort in the project has been doing the controller. And um, so we have, like I said, there's a, the only uh, HCI interface we have currently is the UART one. Um, we, we plan to add some USB support upcoming, so there'll be a, a USB-based one um, fairly soon. And you could also run it combined with the Nimble host. Uh, it supports all the, the 4.2 features. I, you know, I don't think there's anything that's not there. Um, and if you want to go a little bit more into, you know, how the code is sort of laid out and what we've done. So, you know, basically we have, you know, the basis of Minute is our, is our task, um, multitasking, preemptive, you know, task base. You know, you get to, you know, write your own task, choose priorities. Um, you know, generally we want the link layer task to be the highest priority. Um, you could not do that, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I would suggest that. But, um, but it, it gives you the option to do that. Um, and sort of the host and application use a task and the link layer uses a task. So in its smallest form, there's really only two tasks in the system. And, you know, for those of you who do this stuff, you know, that stack, task stacks, you know, can take quite a bit of RAM. Um, so, you know, you, you don't, you, you know, it's up to you. You can have other application tasks doing things if that's what you want. But we try to really, you know, make it so that, you know, in its very basic form, we're only using a couple of the um, OS tasks. As far as uh, state machines go, um, we do have multi-advertising, so you can, there's a configuration option. You can choose how many advertising state machines that you want. Um, there's only currently one scanning or initiating state machine. Um, you know, we may add to that as time goes on. And um, you know, certainly we have um, you know, multiple simultaneous connections. So um, you, know, you can configure the, the device to you know, uh, sort of try to tune it for your application. You know, do you want something that does a lot of connections very quickly and not a lot of data? Do you want to just run one or two connections and you want to push a lot of throughput through them? Um, the scheduler is sort of configurable in a way in how you sort of allocate the base amount of time that gets scheduled for connections. And what you're trying to do is, you know, try to determine like how many connections I think I want, how much time do I want to allocate them, and you configure the system and hopefully it'll sort of optimize for, for your scenario. And it's, um, the scheduler does sort of use this loose time slot based approach. It's not 
there's not fixed time slots for, let's say, advertising, scanning connections. Um, and there's a reason why we went about doing this. We think it's a little bit more flexible. Um, you know, you can have overlapping connection events because um, sometimes, you know, you really, if you're the peripheral, you don't really get to decide, um, you know, when you're going to be scheduled for connection events. So in that case, what it'll do is it'll use a least recently used approach and it'll just, um, you know, round robin the connections and uh, hopefully pick the one that's not going to time out on your supervision timeout uh, uh, sooner. And um, it also uses a sort of, we took a sort of priority approach to it and, uh, you know, and, and if any, you know, if this is something that you wanted to change, you could go in and change it. But um, connections uh, take uh, priority over advertising events and over scanning events. And um, so, you know, what obviously the, the schedule tries to do is tries to put advertising events where connection events are not and tries to move connection events so that, you know, if you're trying to do many of these, you know, it tries to schedule them all in such a way that all can work. And if they can't, um, you know, one takes priority and the other one just gets round robin in later. Um, I think I covered most of that stuff there. So now we're going to move on to the host. Um, so like I had uh, said before, the host and application share a task. And you can split these up into many tasks as you want. Um, generally, most applications probably don't need their own task to run it. But if they do, you know, you can do that. Um, and if you went in, so we don't have uh, an example of this, but it's, it's a pretty simple approach. Basically, the host uses this table-based approach to define services. And if you look at the, this service table, what you'll see is there's an easy way to define characteristics and descriptors. Um, you have a user-defined callback if you want for every single, you know, each characteristic descriptor or service can have its own individual callbacks. You can wrap them all into one, deal with them that way. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility there. Um, and now GAP procedures are, there's a set of API to do most of the GAP procedures, and I think this is common through most Bluetooth stacks. You know, we just chose a set, and um, you can see a couple of the examples there. And again, with most of these, um, you have callbacks that you can, uh, you know, your application can do what you want. Uh, if you sort of look, uh, oh yeah, it's pretty easy to see. The, the BLE GAP event function callback and argument. Um, we have a set of defined events for these things. Uh, so you register your function, um, you know, the function gets called with the various events and contexts, um, you know, for the, the attributes and the services, and um, you write your code to, to, you know, based on what you want to do for the, the reads and writes for that. It's pretty simple. Um, and if you look at the examples, we do have a fair amount of examples to go through, so you can look at the code, see the examples, and it should be really pretty quick to get an application up and running if you're familiar with the, uh, with the spec. Um, so I guess, yeah, and, you know, we support most of the features, you know, pairing, bonding, you know, we have persistence of, uh, you know, the information so that you can bond. Um, and, uh, and you can always go to the um, documentation. There's a fair amount of documentation on the API. And you can look and it describes it. And it's pretty easy to use. Um, so, so, yeah, we have documentation. You can go check that out on the website. And... Um, you know, we have a community, and uh, it's the Apache Minute community, and we're, you know, uh, people are, I would say, extremely responsive. You know, this is my first open source project, so I don't have a lot of familiarity with these things, but, um, you know, there's really good support. So you can go there, ask questions. It's usually answered uh, pretty quickly and thoroughly. And, um, you know, we love committers. We love people, you know, um, contributing to the project. So, you know, it's definitely something we're looking for. And um, you can also contact Runtime about consulting and commercial support for the uh, OS and, and the stack. So, you know, we're available for that. And then, um, you know, if you go into the apps directory, and it's pretty easy, pretty easy to see, you'll go through the, the tree, and um, we have a sort of basic set of apps. Um, you know, BLE Perf is a peripheral, so it shows how to stand up a peripheral and do um, some basic services with it. Uh, BLE Tiny is now somewhat of a misnomer. It's, <laughs> it's not so tiny, but it's... Um, it's sort of like a really good sort of command line test tool to test all aspects of the Bluetooth stack. So you can set up connections, advertise through it, scan, um, and it's a pretty powerful command line tool to do a lot of testing and debugging with, you know, if that's, uh, you know, to sort of get yourself familiar with the stack and, and the code. BLE sent is a central, so it gives a good example of a central. And BLE HCI is the controller only HCI. Um, so, you know, we run it with, you know, Bluesy, it's great. You know, stick it on there and, you know, uh, you can use that as your controller to do testing with. And, um, and I 
think that's pretty much most of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions about the community, the stack, or anything about uh, runtime, I'd be happy to you know, answer them. One thing you didn't talk about very much was the IT Yeah, uh, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, so Newt is a build and package management tool. So it actually bundle, it's the build system we use with our um, OS and project. Uh, there is the ability to run uh, Newt. So we're all, I mean, I think Will is, uses Slick at it. The rest of us are VI and Emacs <laughs> for the most part. Um, so Newt does actually build in. So for example, for every board and processor that we support, uh, we include the debug scripts for download, uh, and debug, and run, and programming. So anybody who writes a BSP makes sure that they actually bring up JLink or OpenOCD or any of those things. Uh, one of the things you can do is you can take Eclipse, uh, and there's doc a, a blog post that a company called CodeCoop wrote on this. We can uh, send it out. Uh, and you can fire up Newt uh, and then use it as a GDB remote. And then you can debug with an Eclipse, and you can call out to the build system with Eclipse. So there's, an, there's a whole set of instructions for configuring it on Eclipse. Actually, one of the nice things uh, that we didn't really realize going into it um, about this approach is that often you have teams where some people use Eclipse, uh, some people use Visual Studio, some other people use just VI and Emacs. And having been the, the guy who uses VI all the time, uh, the, the problem you often get is that the make system is some uh, Eclipse uh, Studio uh, mess. Um, and so the nice thing about having Newt build and package management and debug is that it works for people who use Eclipse, but there's also a very nice command line interface for people who are just VI and Emacs users, which is me. Yeah, the talk was mainly about the Newt stack, but the, the new tool is like, you know, a big part of what we do. There's a talk at 2 p.m. tomorrow on Newt. Uh, so if you want to come learn more. Uh, yeah. So this is, I really appreciate what you're doing and the way you're putting it out there, and it's absolutely fantastic. So, so I mean, I've got 20 years of experience in doing the design of all of this cool stuff, but then coming into this, it's, it's a really a learning curve for what we choose to do. Yeah. So I mean, my approach from the, from the first part is to look at it, you know, try and get a little bit of the environment going, and then pick what your model So yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, we can always get better, and, and we know we need to get better, right? especially as an open source project. But uh, some, some pointers that I'd give you is the, the minute documentation. So uh, the, that there has uh, a tutorial on building a sample BLE application, and the, the very basic one. There's also an example on how to uh, hook in an air quality sensor and make the, the results of that or CO2 sensor, actually, make the results of that CO2 sensor available uh, as a BLE, BLE peripheral. Uh, so you actually go through the process of, uh, there's an iOS app along with it. All of that is in the core minute documentation itself. So there are some tutorials and then a, a bunch of detail in the documentation itself. Uh, and then there are, the, the sample apps are a really good way of getting that up and running as well. So BLE sent and BLE perif. Uh, and, and they work together. So you can, one of them starts up as a central, the other starts up as a peripheral. Uh, I don't know, Will, if well, you want to add. And, and also, I think something to add with, um, you know, we wanted to get the basics in uh, you know, first, and uh, we will start adding a lot of profiles to the system. And, you know, so if you, you know, just want to use standard profile, don't want to do anything tricky, that will all be just right there for you. I mean, right now we have, um, I think there's only one or two profiles that we've added. But that's something we plan to start adding, you know, quite a bit more. So, you know, I think that would address a lot of concerns. Yeah. Other than, you know, it just does it right out of the box. You don't have to worry about anything, you know, unless you want to do something different. Absolutely fantastic what you're doing, and yet you still find coming in, you know, from the top and parachuting in. You know, what do I have to learn about to begin with, just to be able to even start, uh, you know, prototyping on some of those things, right? So, anything you do on those, you know, just to support the, the, the newbies, for example. <laughs> 
No. I'm completely unfamiliar with Bluetooth when we, I think we were both unfamiliar with Bluetooth when we started and it's its own world, right? Like we had had, Will had written wireless Macs for like 20 years and, and then you go to Bluetooth and it's not IP and it has all of its own terms and there's like a whole set of profiles that nobody who's developing connected products actually really even uses. It's mostly for keyboard guys and, and, and headphone guys. So there's really a, uh, it, it's, it, it's definitely a learning curve coming to it. Um, so I totally agree. Uh, it well, so they have their own controller. That was actually con the, the the long story on that was that was actually contributed by Nordic uh, slightly after we wrote our controller. Um, but we also uh, can interface with the Zephyr. Uh, so Zephyr has its own host stack that was developed by Johan right there. Uh, um, I will talk about the Zephyr tomorrow. Okay. And he'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, Zephyr can work with either the Nimble controller or the one contributed by Nordic. Uh, the one by Nordic is, is, is Nordic only, uh, whereas we, we are moving to support the KW41Z from NXP as well. We have radio abstraction there. Yeah. We are looking to support other radios. Yeah. Well, looks like you guys will get to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the question is yeah. like more about, again, there are so many options. Yeah. Right? So, uh, you know, we actually just took a look at your soft device. Right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of thing that yeah. actually we as a deal when we are using the platform to develop the product. Yep. And you know, it would be interesting to understand better what are the good options for people. Yeah, I mean you know, from our perspective, I think more open source options are are good. Yeah, we like Zephyr. So we're, this is more of a runtime perspective. I can't speak for Minute because we're runtime and we're involved in both Zephyr and in Minute. Okay. Um, so from, from our perspective, like, you know, the great thing about having a bunch of open source code is we can go look, look at it and steal it um, and vice versa. So for example, in my new, I, I don't know how much Zephyr is taken from us, but we certainly, a, a lot of the security manager, we took the implementation and the code, you know, we attribute Zephyr, it's pretty much all there from Zephyr, right? Um, and if you look at the controller stuff, uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's a lot of code sharing there. Uh, we like having our Bluetooth stack for, for a number of reasons uh, within the Minute project. Uh, one is we have a fair amount of customer usage on our stack. And so as runtime, uh, you know, we, we came out with Minute uh, and it was a little bit, I'd say, earlier, especially on the controller side than, than the Zephyr support came in. And so a number of customers have actually deployed this in production and we have a whole set of unit tests for that and a whole set of use cases that customers are using it on. So. I think you know what you're going to see in this space is going to be a lot of projects that hopefully over time will co collaborate and hopefully coalesce. Uh, but it's actually compared to where it was because I've been you know in embedded microcontrollers and then maybe that's caused brain damage for for over ten years and everything was proprietary and if you wanted to do you know something you had to do it yourself. Um, <laughs> So we, we, for example, at Silver Spring, we, like, we bought an IP stack. We spent probably two to three years of engineering effort on that IP stack and really, really good engineers that have never seen the light of day, right? And it's implementing things like IPsec, which are completely commodity, um, but we had to implement you know, Ike v2 and, and all of these things that uh, were code that we just had that we try to upstream with a proprietary stack vendor that we worked with that was just actually absolutely a nightmare. Uh, so from a user perspective, I mean, I, I, I encourage you to download them, compare number of connections, compare power usage, compare uh, throughput, RAM and code sizes. All of those things are really, uh, I think, go into your decision as well as community and, and, and all of those things. But in general, I think having a lot of open source code out there and it's all Apache licensed that we can share and collaborate on is, is actually a fairly good thing. But again, going back to uh, my new is that Nimble is being tied to Android. Uh, we are actually working to break it out of, of, of Minute and making it more useful for other people. So we've been working uh, 
with other, we can't really say too much, but we are, you know, we, we essentially designed a build and package management system into Minute. The problem is when you're kind of developing an operating system, it's really hard to, uh, you know, change your OS APIs and have the separate Bluetooth stack that's constantly being developed and having to evolve those two at the same time is actually a fairly painful effort, especially for a small team, which we were. Uh, but th the goal with Nimble is actually to eventually break it out of Minute and have all of the operating systems in the space be able to use it. Um, so that is certainly something that's been designed into Minute itself. Uh, there's actually a talk tomorrow on something called MCU boot, which is one of the first things we've broken out of the Minute operating system, and it's a, boot, a secure bootloader that works across both Zephyr and Minute. Uh, so that's an example of where we are taking a component that's in Minute and looking to share it. It's a little bit trickier on the Bluetooth stack side because Zephyr has one and we have one and we have customers on ours and so we need to support it and those type of things. So there it's more of a sharing and code access. But we certainly are looking to break Nimble out and make it cross OS. Um, we think more, is, more sharing is better. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to come up to us and. <laughs>